want us to go to Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 8. And we're going to read from verses 26 through, through 40. I want to speak about the importance of a soul, the importance of an individual. It says in verse 26 of Acts chapter 8, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, Philip started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch. That's a handful or mouthful there. An Ethiopian eunuch. Evidently, the man was from Ethiopia, number one, a country in Africa, the Middle East. And secondly, he was a eunuch. Um, that, that means an individual. Sometimes these individuals were castrated for service. Long story there. We don't want to get into that. Uh, there's different understandings about this. But they were, these individuals were not married and were physically altered for uh, service, just, I guess, to ensure their loyalty, to ensure their honesty by not having family to get corrupted with money and so on and so forth. And they were dedicated for service. And uh, so this man occupied a very important place in, uh, in Ethiopia, an Ethiopian eunuch. And he was an important official, it says here, in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him, that is in his chariot. The eunuch was reading this passage from Scripture, this passage about the, the, the uh, suffering servant. It's a prophecy in Isaiah 53 that referred to the coming Messiah, the, the coming Christ. And it said in this passage, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. This is the passage that the eunuch is reading. Now the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. Talk about water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azoros and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. More than 150 years ago, in the 1850s, um, a Bible school, a, a Sunday school teacher felt uh, prompted by the Lord to leave his job for a moment and walk to a shoe store right here in Boston and to share the gospel with a young man who was working in that shoe store. His uncle owned it and uh, to present to him the gospel of Christ. This young man heard um, the word of God presented by this loving, diligent uh, Sunday school teacher, accepted the Lord, and the world was forever changed because that young man's name was Dwight L. Moody. And Dwight L. Moody uh, initiated a life 
of incredible ministry after that moment that he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Dwight L. Moody went to become probably one of the most, if not probably, but certainly one of the most effective evangelists, missionaries, church planters, uh, spreaders of the gospel that has ever existed. Dwight L. Moody revolutionized 19th century England and Scotland and traveled to France and to Spain and had a, an incredible ministry. Now, Dwight L. Moody, when he received the gospel, was practically illiterate, totally uneducated. He had grown up in the rural parts of uh, uh, Northfield. And uh, the Lord anointed him in, in such a spectacular way that not only did he overcome his illiteracy, but he was able to minister to the sophisticated European continent in ways that many of the highly educated uh, ministers of England had not been able to do. And, and so Moody, uh, and he, sometimes people made fun of him in, <clears throat> in Europe because of his accent uh, and his way of speaking, his colorful way of talking. But he had an anointing from the Lord that enabled him to, enabled him to be uh, unnaturally, uncannily effective in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Moody preached the gospel to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in the 19th century. And then when he returned to America, he started all kinds of uh, amazing ministries. He started actually as a Sunday school teacher for children in the ghetto of Chicago. And these children, nobody wanted them. In the, talk about ministry to children and the ministry of the Word that we were talking about through Dave and uh, the discipleship ministry and, and Jonathan, the children's ministry and the youth ministry. Nobody wanted these children, but... Uh, uh, Moody was so possessed by a desire to share the gospel that he took these children in and started a Sunday school for kids that uh, brought thousands of kids into the kingdom. Abraham Lincoln visited his uh, Sunday school once. And Moody started countless institutions, Moody Bible Institute uh, in Chicago, which is now one of the most important and powerful uh, seminaries. Uh, Moody Publications, he published all kinds of tracts and um, books on evangelism and, and evangelistic uh, publications of all kinds of sorts that reach hundreds of thousands of people. He started a school for missionaries and for teachers right here in Northfield. Those buildings are still there because he had an uncanny ability also to harness the, the money and the resources of uh, very wealthy people to build institutions. So he started the Northfield and the Mount Hermon schools there in Northfield. And uh, he was, <clears throat> his ministry was responsible for uh, the beginning of the student movement and the student missionary movement that sent thousands of missionaries all over the world. And I could go on and on. <clears throat> his uh, evangelistic ministry in, impacted the life of Billy Graham and of all the major evangelists that followed him. He established a, a pattern for effective evangelism. All of that and much more because this diligent, spirit-filled Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball, you can read his story, um, felt that he needed to go and minister to this very unpromising young man. But what Kimball saw was a soul, a precious soul that needed to hear the gospel. He did not, I'm sure, have any suspicion of what that unpromising young man would one day become. And so this is an illustration of what I want to talk about, about the importance of a single soul and about the importance of us as members of this congregation to live out a lifestyle of evangelism, to Look at every opportunity that we can and take advantage of every opportunity that we can to put a seed of the gospel in people's lives around us. I think many of us feel that we are entering into a season of harvesting as a congregation, that we are going to another level of effectiveness and, and power and anointing 
both the English uh, ministry is feeling that, the Spanish ministry is feeling its own sense of momentum. God is doing something, and we must take advantage of this wind of the Spirit that we have behind our sails. We must take advantage of every opportunity that God provides us to bring souls to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We know that Christ came to the world, as he himself said, to save what was lost. And repeatedly, Jesus showed the importance of uh, the church concentrating everything on evangelizing men and women. This is the heart of the church. This is why we exist, people. Service is good. Worshiping the Lord is necessary and wonderful. Growing in the Word is important. But all of those things lead to one inescapable action, which is to use the gifting, the endowment that we receive from those various activities to bring others to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If we truly believe that He is the only way and the only means to have reconciliation and communion with God, and that it is the only way to enter into an eternal life, how can we doubt of the urgency and the importance of overcoming fear, timidity, understandable uh, reservations that we all experience in order to fulfill the calling of Christ, for us to become evangelists uh, in our life, in our neighborhoods, in our place of work, in our friendships and relationships. And I know that if we continue uh, stoking the fires of evangelism, prophesying evangelism, speaking about it, practicing it, celebrating evangelistic results, God is going to honor our actions and he's going to bless us with an evangelistic harvest, ever growing, ever increasing. The Great Commission, what we call the Great Commission at the end of Christ's ministry, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of the nations and teaching them to obey my commandments in the power that I have received from the Father that I now delegate to you. Jesus trained his disciples. We see the urgency, the importance of uh, evangelistic ministry. And the fact that he, he continually was sending them away into missions and into practical applications of how to effectively evangelize, evangelize people. Um, he uh, endowed them with power and authority. He exemplified in his own ministry, in his own life, as he ministered, for example, to the Samaritan woman and uh, put aside his own physical needs in order to bring her to a saving knowledge of who he was. Jesus was known for abandoning the multitudes that follow him to minister to a single soul. So we have, for example, Zacchaeus. Jesus is walking, crowds are following him. He notices this man on top of a tree, by the Spirit, he knows that this man is a lost soul that is attracted to his ministry. And Jesus stops what he's doing, addresses Zacchaeus, tells him that tonight he wants to be in his house having dinner with him and his friends. And a huge evangelistic harvest takes place there as these publicans, these sinful men, corrupt men, give their lives over to Jesus Christ, including, of course, Zacchaeus himself. But Jesus knew that this man was a soul that was hungry and thirsty for the gospel. And he did what he had to do to bring him into saving knowledge of Christ. And I've already alluded to the Samaritan woman as well, this woman who was uh, excluded from the company of other respectable, quote-unquote, women. But Jesus knew the, the, the grace and, and the richness, the human richness that inhabited this woman. And he dedicated time and... Uh, dialogue to bring her into salvation. And here, in the case of uh, Philip, the eunuch, we see something very similar. Philip, if you read the um, previous parts of this chapter, because in verse 9 it says, now for some time. This now means that there's a reference to earlier uh, allusions. 
to uh, Philip and to what is happening here. Philip has been involved in a great revival that is taking place in the region of Samaria. Many, many people are coming to Christ. And there's a huge revival. Signs and wonders are happening. Every activity brings many new souls into, into the kingdom. Um, but for, for this moment in time, what we see here in chapter 8 is that God changes Philip's agenda, interrupts this great revival, this mass reception of souls into the kingdom, and assigns him the task of going to a specific place without even knowing what he is going to find there. I love those uh, moments where God just kind of puts somebody in front of you or opens the, the, the door to a conversation that can lead to a dialogue about salvation and so on. So Philip hears from an angel, goes to where the angel assigns him, and a, a beautiful dialogue ensues. And we will talk a little bit more about it. But he finds this chariot in this lonely road that led from Jerusalem toward Gaza and that later would lead to Ethiopia because this man is returning. He's a God-fearing Gentile. There were that kind of individual who, through commerce and political contact, were involved in diplomatic um, contact with Israel and the Roman Empire that ruled over Israel. These men, and maybe some women as well, um, would become familiar with Judaism, and uh, they would realize the beauty, the ethical power and greatness of Judaism and, and uh, the, the religious validity of uh, Judaism. And they would not necessarily become Jews in, in their faith, but they would realize that God, the God of the Jews, was real. And they would not convert, but they, they uh, felt like, just like so many people here in America, they may not be Christians in the deep sense of the word, but they fear God. They know that God exists. They, they love God. They, um, they even read the Bible. They watch programs on television. But they have not yet made a decision for Christ. And so Philip was this kind of individual. He was a Gentile who had been somehow pre-evangelized. He had come specifically to worship God at this time in Jerusalem. was returning, and he stops there at this road in the middle of the Gaza road leading to where he's coming from. And the Holy Spirit stops him there, sends Philip before he returns back to his home country. And this dialogue uh, begins. And there are four things that I see through this uh, um, passage that I want to uh, name to you and, and briefly uh, mention. Number one, look at the, the role that the Holy Spirit plays in this uh, encounter. The role of the Holy Spirit, and of course, we're going to apply this to our own lives. The role of the Holy Spirit. Number two, we're going to see the importance that God himself assigns to a single soul. A single individual. Number three, we're going to see the power of the Scriptures and the role that the Scriptures should play when we are trying to evangelize someone. Number four, we're going to see about this God that opens opportunities sovereignly that we are to enter into in the evangelistic uh, effort. And number five, we're going to see the need to, for us to have a trusting obedience when the Lord prompts us to engage in evangelism. So the first thing that I see here is this... this uh, permeating influence of the Holy Spirit. It is everywhere in this passage. Philip evidently is a man filled with the Holy Spirit. God does incredible miracles. He operates in the gifts of the Spirit. You will see if you read the, the beginning of the passage, God uses him for healings, for deliverance. So this man is in very powerful communion with the Holy Spirit. Philip listens from and is in touch with the Holy Spirit. That's why God sends his angel to reveal to him the need to go and see this man in the road uh, toward uh, Gaza. So he hears, he's in communion, just like we need to be in communion with the Holy Spirit. He, um, he has, God, the Holy Spirit has prepared this man before Philip arrives and has placed this passage of the, what's called the suffering servant. Jews have to this day not understood that this passage of Isaiah 53 refers to Jesus, the Messiah. 
They expected a triumphant Messiah who would not suffer. He would install triumphantly the new era of uh, uh, Jewish and uh, Israelite influence over the world. They did not know, they did not see these passages. Sometimes, you know, our own preconceptions and our own prejudices put a lens that uh, filters what, how we read Scripture. That's what we have to ask the Lord. Father, give us understanding so that we can understand the Scriptures the way you want us to understand the Scriptures. Because a Spirit-filled person and a person who is half is anemic in the Holy Spirit may read the same passage and see two totally different things. It's amazing because worldview and outlook is a filter that allows us to see different things. We may be reading the same grammar, the same linguistic uh, makeup, but we may understand different things because the mind, the brain is formatted in a certain way. So this, the Jews did not understand that this was referring specifically to the suffering servant, that Jesus would be crucified, that he would die for the sins of mankind, that his death would bring salvation. And this is the essence of the gospel, by the way. This is why the, uh, God did not have uh, access at that point, let's say, to the book of Matthew or, or Luke or whatever. They just had, at that point, the, the uh, Old Testament. So God uses a, an eminently evangelistic passage to prepare this man. The Holy Spirit is at, is at work here. So this man is reading that passage and setting him up for this conversation that he's going to have with Philip. So look at all the different things that the Holy Spirit is doing here. The Holy Spirit uh, at the end of the passage snatches Philip uh, supremely, sovereignly, and, and physically transports him back to another place. So this passage you know, shows us over and over again how the Holy Spirit is involved in the evangelization of this man. If we want to be effective evangelists, we must always be in contact with the Spirit of God. We have to cultivate that communion with God that allows us to hear from Him. How do you, how do, you do that? You do that through the study of the Word. You do that through act, active affirmation that there is such a thing as the Holy Spirit that speaks to you. That the Holy Spirit is not some sort of uh, generic manifestation of God that acted back in the first century and doesn't act anymore. No, He acts today. And so you have to seek that Holy Spirit. I, I was reading a commentary on this passage a while ago. And, you know, it was a 19th century commentary from a Presbyterian, highly um, developed uh, commentator of the, of the Bible. And it was sad to me to see how this man went through all kinds of uh, um, efforts to water down this miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit about snatching Philip and taking him back after the end of his uh, presentation. It, it's sad how sometimes we can believe that the Holy Spirit is no longer active in the way that we see in the Bible. And, and I ask you to be passionate about seeking the power and the endowment of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until you have been endowed with power from on high through the Holy Spirit. You need the power of the Spirit for every action, every moment of your life. Do not take the Holy Spirit for granted. Ask him to fill you. It's not enough just to believe in Christ. For salvation it is. But for effectiveness in service and in life, you need the active intervention of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot there, but that's all I can say for the moment. Um, as you hear from God, as you live a life of the Holy Spirit, God will provide opportunities to you, as he did Philip. He will show you effective ways to present the gospel. Thoughts and images will come to your mind to present the gospel effectively, just as uh, Philip did. He asked, hey, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand? What a, what a catchy question. Sometimes a question can open a conversation. Sometimes planting a, a word into the mind of a person will unleash a question from them that will open the door for you to present the gospel. So Philip, endowed by the Holy Spirit, it's provided with an effective way to present the gospel. Also, the Holy Spirit will prepare the person. People will be made permeable and open and, and curious and, and uh, penetrable to the, the preaching of the gospel. I think many times, you know, people are hardened 
because we haven't asked the Lord to soften their hearts. If you know anyone who needs to hear the gospel in your workplace or in your family, pray for them. Pray for them preemptively. Pray for them day after day. Lord, give me an opportunity. Open their hearts. Prepare the way. God will give you wisdom to answer difficult questions. Many times people will leave you, leave you baffled with a question that comes out of nowhere, and you're like there trying to answer in one second. Ask the Holy Spirit at that moment, Holy Spirit, give me the answer. Give me the word that this person requires. And finally, the Holy Spirit will remove obstacles from the minds of people. Um, the Bible says that the God of this age, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Many times we're not preaching to a person who is neutral about the gospel. Many times we're preaching to a person who is blind about the gospel, who has a, a, dev a, a demonic supernatural veil over their understanding and we have to rend that veil and god the holy spirit has to just tear it from their minds the secular intellectual world is full of individuals who have their understanding veiled and only a supernatural intervention from god can take that veil away and that is the kind of thing that the holy spirit does so remember the importance of walking in the power of the holy spirit Remember that verse, Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the power, the intervention, the function of the Holy Spirit in becoming an effective evangelism, just as God wants you. Number two, we see in this passage the importance that God assigns to a single person, a single soul as opposed to a lot of people and masses of people. Philip, we see, is, is being used greatly by God to bring crowds to Jesus. But in this case, God is interrupting his schedule so that he will go and preach to one single individual. Brothers and sisters, let's not underestimate the importance of a soul. God can use that person in forms that we can even imagine, just as he used Dwight L. Moody in the future. And really, I believe that the majority, the great portion of evangelism must be like that, one on one. Our church has grown especially through evangelism shared with one person. We really haven't had any mass evangelism. Maybe someday the Lord will allow us to bring in crowd. Praise the Lord. I'm praying for that. But churches I've seen in the 20th, 20th century, 21st century especially, grow through one on one evangelism, one Christian sharing the gospel effectively with another unbeliever. Um, and this is where our own personal testimony is important. is important. Prepare your testimony. In three minutes, be able to tell what God has done in your life. People can refute all kinds of um, arguments, intellectual arguments, theological arguments, but your life speaks in ways that nobody can refute. Your drama, what God has done, the change that you have experienced, how your life has been transformed, what you were before, what you are now. Moments when you have seen God displaying his power in very critical ways in your life. These are things that provoke intrigue and question in people's minds. And so prepare your testimony. Speak about what the Lord has done in your life. Lead the conversation into why you come to church, why you serve, why you've given your life to the Lord because these individual moments are the key to an evangelistic church. This eunuch, this Ethiopian, is a, is a fascinating individual. He is a highly placed uh, functionary. Uh, he's a bureaucrat in the court of the queen of Ethiopia. He's his, her treasurer. Philip doesn't know this. Many times we minister to people and we don't even know what God is doing in their lives or what he will do. And this man, if you study history, I don't have the time now to go into that. The, the, the Ethiopian church today, which is one of the few vibrant, strong churches in the Middle East and in North Africa, that Ethiopian church traces its beginnings to this eunuch. There, there has been a vibrant Ethiopian church since the early 4th century at least. And before that, there are many evidences of Christianity in Ethiopia. 
And the Ethiopian tradition shares the, the, the view that this man, and they even have his name, um, was instrumental in uh, inst instilling the gospel and bringing the gospel. The Ethiopians are a fascinating people for many different reasons. But this man played a, a key role in uh, Ethiopia. And so the Lord sends uh, Philip to uh, minister uh, to him. Um, and Philip is simply, you know, under the, the, the command of the Holy Spirit to do this. So evidently the Holy Spirit has a very singular purpose for this man. As I say before, when you evangelize a soul, you may be saving someone, not only their person. You evangelize a young man. Who, you, you may be saving him from a life of a crime or a life of stagnation or uh, from just wasting uh, their life. I, I praise the Lord for Emily, for example, who came when she was six years old to Lion of Judah. And we didn't care that she was six years old. Emily had a, a, a thirst for God, and her, she came with her brother. And Emily stayed here. The church invested in her, and, and people loved her. And here she is, a beautiful young woman, serving uh, the, the city uh, in, through her teaching career, saving young people's lives from all kinds of things, and, and working in her church to bring other young people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that beautiful? Because we invested in a child, in a child. Wilson could have led a life of crime. He was steered in that direction. He was what we call a titere, just a, a real, you know, a mess of a young guy. Yeah. And uh, here he is, again, playing a huge role in the, cities, uh, in the city of Boston, in the Boston public schools, and, and the father of two very beautiful young girls who are now on their way to becoming beautiful, beautiful human beings as well because the church invested in him as well. So you never know what Ethiopian eunuch you may find. And I, I live possessed by that, you know, by, by that um, uh, feeling of the importance. And I, I don't want to take too much time, but, but I could give you many examples of how the Lord sometimes steers me toward individuals who don't seem too promising to share the gospel. Because I know that inside of them, there is uh, palpitating and, and pulsating and beating a soul that is eternal and that is infinitely precious to the Lord you know, God doesn't care about the outer garments. You may find somebody out there asking for a quarter uh, in the corner of Albany Street and Mass Avenue. Go past their dirty clothes or their unpromising look and see a precious eternal soul that is as precious as the soul of a president or a, uh, an executive of a world corporation. Souls are eternal. Souls is the very life of God. It doesn't matter the outer trappings. That's just circumstantial. They're all the same. They have the same value before the Lord. And that is what we need to connect with. That is what we need to value and uh, do everything that we can to uh, instill the love of Christ. So we see then we need the Holy Spirit. We need to value every human soul. Another important element that we see here is uh, the, the role that Scripture plays in this whole drama that we have before us, in this process of evangelism. The Ethiopian is reading from Isaiah chapter 53, as I said earlier, the suffering servant that is going to give his life, is going to suffer injustice for the salvation of many. That is the drama that we need to present to people, that we are all lost we fell from the grace of God in some millennial time when God created the earth and created humankind. The fall affected deeply all of creation. And since the fall of man back in the Garden of Eden, creation has not been what it was designed to be. And so crime, poverty, exploitation, violence, death, homicide, all the ills of uh, the cosmos entered into the human situation. And from that very moment, God initiated a process that would culminate in the coming of Jesus Christ to take us from that tragedy of the fall and of enmity and hostility between God and us. And Jesus, who is God himself, 
in, through some transaction that we cannot even understand, assume the human form entered through the biology of a woman, Mary, and acquired human form, being God and man. He had the DNA of God and the DNA of humanity because God had a, a role in his conception. And so Jesus, God, comes into the world to correct that uh, deformity that resulted from the fall. He gives his life and leaves a church to continue his mission of preaching the gospel, preaching salvation. He gives his life for us. And in giving his life, he pays the price that we were supposed to pay because of our own disobedience, because we were, we were all affected with the tendency to sin and to have enmity with God. So Jesus gives his life on the cross, and through the, the, the releasing of his life and the death that he uh, experienced, he earned salvation for each and one of us as our own representative. And now, as we accept the, what God did, and we say, yes, I believe that that is true. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, that he was resurrected, that he is the Lord, he is my Savior. When you say yes to that, you are signing a document that brings life to you too. And uh, this is what is called accepting Christ as your Savior. You are saying, by the justice of Christ, I am also just. By his sacrifice on the cross, I have earned salvation and, and I have reestablished communion with God. And now you have the opportunity. You are healed. You are forgiven. You have paid the price through Christ. He has paid it for you. And now you have salvation and eternal life. This is the essence. You have to use the scriptures. You have to use this special drama that the scripture tells us in order to understand what salvation is. And so the Lord leads uh, the eunuch in code, and Philip is there to take the scriptures and show him what they mean. There is nothing like evangelizing people through the use of the scriptures. The use of the scriptures, the quoting of a verse, is the life of God directly thrown at the spirit of a person. Your words are great, they count, but nothing like the fresh fruit of the Spirit taken from the tree itself. A word, a verse that blesses you and gives you energy and, and touches the person as well and opens their eyes to the truth of God. It has a great power. And you must memorize some of those words. You, you have to memorize four, five, six key verses. Besides all the other verses, I think memorizing key verses of Scripture is important for every area of life. But, you know, there are verses that just are filled with content. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. You have the whole Bible right there. And if you take every piece of it and you share it with a person in three, four minutes, don't preach them a sermon, just basic teachings from that powerful text. It will open all kinds of things. Salvation is not by faith, not by works. Again, how are you saved? You're not saved by your justice or by your good works. You're saved by receiving Christ and affirming Him and confessing Him as your Lord and Savior. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not for works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians. I could go on and on. Now, you may not be able to memorize. Don't, don't get stuck on just, you know, the exact words. But make sure that you read these verses long enough so that the content will be in your soul and your mind. And you can jump from one concept to the other and use it creatively. Don't necessarily go around beating people with the Bible. No. Use, use the word creatively and, and digest it and, and turn it back. But it's great when sometimes you can quote a verse as well. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John, I believe it's 832. What a beautiful verse. The knowledge of Christ by itself breaks through bondage and brings you into truth. So you see the power of the Scripture. God setting up the Scripture to provide an opportunity for the message. Number four, I, I mentioned about opportunities that God opens up sovereignly. We have to take advantage of the opportunities that God brings. Many times God opens a door. You know, there may be, you, you see the conversation going in a certain way, but somehow, you know, you're, you just, ah, that's, you, you turn it around, you continue talking about the, how bad the coffee is at home or, you know, the, 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 the traffic or whatever. But 
There may have been something there that God was saying. And you got to take the opportunity. You got to at least take a little bit, the step a little bit further to stimulate the conversation in that direction. Listen for opportunities. Expect that God. Be alert. That's the other thing. You, you take advantage, you be alert. If you are living a, an evangelistic lifestyle, you are seeing every conversation with someone as a potential opportunity to bring the gospel to them. You have to be fanatical in a way, obsessive, because that's your call. That's your mission. That's your reason for being. That's what justifies your place on earth. How many have had, had the, the, the privilege and the joy of bringing a person? You don't need to lift, lift, raise your hands. Bringing a person to Jesus Christ. There is nothing more sublime. Ask, if you haven't had that opportunity, ask the Lord desperately to give you the opportunity to bring a person to a knowledge of Christ. Pray for opportunities. Pray, Lord, I am hungry to bring souls to Christ. Make me an effective evangelist. Pray that the Lord will provide you with opportunities. To share the gospel and then lastly create opportunities sometimes we got to push the door a little bit the bible says to preach the gospel in season and out of season sometimes we have to be a little forceful we have to be a, you know uh the, the bible says that the the, the the kingdom proceeds through force many times we have to i, I remember my wife uh, years ago we were uh, uh, in the border cafe in in cambridge and uh, Sonia, who is today uh, the wife of a pastor, Stephen Johnson, in Dedham, and she also plays a very effective pastoral role in, in that church, in that ministry with her husband. You know, Sonia, uh, my wife's youngest uh, sister, a sibling, had led a life that was uh, very secular, very unchristian when, when she was in high school and college. And I remember that that day we were sitting down in uh, the Border Cafe having lunch. And she, Sonia was with her boyfriend, this unbelieving guy, very secular, very successful. And uh, they were talking, and the conversation turned. And my wife turned the conversation to the gospel. We're, I'm talking about at least 20, it must have been 20 years ago, maybe a little bit less, but it was close to that. And, uh, you know, at one moment in the conversation, my wife just thrust the question to Sonia. Would you like to accept Jesus right now as your Savior? And I tell you, I winced. I got a little bit, uh, I felt a little bit, of, bit of comfortable because the conversation was not really, it didn't seem to be leading to that. And that's why I say, I was telling the group that we met with yesterday that sometimes, you know, we can be a little timid and overly respectful. I think one of the greatest uh, achievements of the devil has been to fill us with fear. And with false respect about privacy, about, you know, the rights of individuals, not wanting to violate their privacy. This is a demonic veil that the enemy has uh, cast over 21st century culture. Respect for privacy. And we, we need to, of course. And we need to be, you know, uh, wise and discerning and prudent and all those different things. But sometimes it just calls for boldness. You know, you, you say, if I perish, I perish, like uh, Esther said. If they want to, you know, sever the relationship, well, uh, at least I said to, I, I, I can be at peace, that I, I gave him the word, you know. So anyway, my wife uh, tells Sonia, do you want to, and you know, I'm here thinking, oh, man, this is going to be uncomfortable. But I've learned to respect those bold moments and just to step aside. And, you know, like through a, through a movie, I, I saw Sonia said, start crying and say, yes, I, I want to accept Jesus. And right there in the border cafe, in the middle of a very crowded restaurant, Sonia bowed her head and prayed the sinner's prayer and asked Jesus to come into her life. And 20 years later, she is the, the wife of a pastor serving the Lord effectively. And so many wonderful things have happened. She was new, completely changed, transformed from that moment on. She straightened out her life. She uh, served Christ and is still a very effective servant because my wife was bold. She, she, she created an opportunity. She didn't have it, but she just took it anyway. And we need to be uh, like that. We need to uh, take those opportunities. And finally, the fifth one that I, I was talking about, this passage teaches us to be trusting and obedient. To be obedient. Why do I say that? Because Philip is given a command, go and preach the gospel to this man. He does it. 
And then after preaching the gospel to, you know, the man, they, they become separated. Philip never found out what happened. I'm sure he didn't. There, there was no internet where the eunuch could say, hey, thanks, Philip. I arrived here in Ethiopia, and it was great to talk to you. And, uh, you know, my trip was made nicer by our conversation. I'm here preaching the gospel in, you know, in the palace. No, they were separated. Goodbye. I'll never see you again. They never saw each other again. But Philip did what he had to do. And how many times I have shared the gospel with someone, and then I see them coming to church. Or I see them accepting the Lord, growing in the Lord. It's amazing. You may never know. Uh, you know, sometimes, as, a, as a, uh, Paul says, I sowed, Apollos watered, but the growth is given by God. Don't uh, get hung up on whether the person accepts the gospel or not. That's not your responsibility. That's above your pay grade, as they say. Your role, my role, is to preach the gospel. To give people the opportunity to say yes or no. To discharge our responsibility. There are so many passages that, that say, you know, when I tell you to announce salvation to someone, if you announce it to them and they say no, that's their problem. Their blood will be upon them. But if I tell you to share the gospel and you don't, you are responsible for their loss, the loss of their salvation. And I will demand that from you. It doesn't mean that you will lose your salvation necessarily. I, I think this is a mysterious passage. But it does mean that there is a price incurred when you squander an opportunity to share the gospel with a friend. I think there are, there are many of you here who can be more effective in evangelism than I as a pastor. Sometimes I'm hesitant to tell people that I'm, the, I'm a pastor when they ask me, what, what do I do? Because immediately they shut down. They become something totally artificial. But you have an opportunity. You have friends. You have companions at work. You meet people in, in all kinds of situations. You have relatives. I know that in each one of you is beating right now the heart of a potential evangelist. There's four or five souls at the very least in your, in your inner being right now that God wants you to share the gospel with. Would you accept with me right now that challenge? Would you bow your head? And also I want to ask uh, as I share the gospel that if there is anyone this morning here who feels that they, they want to give their life to Christ and you have heard the gospel preached today in all kinds of ways and you, you want to square things away with God. You feel that you have maybe offended Him or you have been separated from Him. And you need to re-establish the dial tone with God. Remember what the Bible says, that it is through Christ, that suffering servant that the eunuch was reading about. It is the only way to salvation, communion, relationship with God. And if you want to establish that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I would invite you even right now and if you've come with someone, I would invite them to bring you over. Or I would invite that person who invited you to encourage you gently. But is there anyone this morning who wants to accept Christ? If you have not done it before and you want to do it this morning, I would love to pray with you. Is there anyone here? We just want to make sure that you have that opportunity. Do not let fear or shyness prevent you from entering into a relationship with Christ. I would ask you to raise your hand right now and I can pray for you right from where you are. Or if you want to come forward or whatever. And even as we pray to f finish this service, if you feel that call, I would love to see you come forward and, and, and put right your relationship with God through Jesus Christ and ask Him to establish a relationship, a permanent relationship with Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. I am delighted, delighted, my sister. Delighted. Your beautiful daughters as well. We're so happy for you. Thank you for blessing us. And we bless you right now. What is your name? Forgive me. Tasha? With a K or a T? T. Kasha. Kasha. All right, Kasha. We bless you. Let's stand. Let's bless Kasha's life. You are a precious soul. Your two daughters are precious to the Lord. And we will see you one day, young lady. Her name? Diamari. Diamari. 
dear Mari, she wanted to come up. Dear Mari, you're going to be like Emily one day, a beautiful woman of God. And also your little sister as well, because God is, he values you so much, he loves you so much. And right now, Father, I declare your Holy Spirit in the life of this family. Father, just as she holds her daughters in her hands with such decisiveness, you hold them in your hand as well. And we declare that a new destiny opens up before them, a new road in the journey. Father, your yes, your amen, your promise of blessing, protection, guidance opens up in their life. And we believe by faith that you are going to do extraordinary things in their lives. And right now we declare them property of the kingdom of God. As you, Kasha, confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen. You believe that he died for you on the cross. That he's your Savior. That he has forgiven you. That he has earned relationship with God. And he gives you access to every benefit of being a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so we bless you for that. We declare the saving, loving blood of Christ in your life and yours and your home and all kinds of blessings that will come your way and especially salvation unto eternity for you and yours. So, Father, we thank you for Kasha and her family. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us the joy of seeing many, many come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Turn us as a congregation into an engine for evangelism. Make us ravenously hungry for souls and send the anointing of your Holy Spirit because it is through that anointing that we can become effective for you. Take away every fear. Take away all shyness and make us bold for the kingdom, Lord. And we want to see every seat filled with a saved soul, Father. We rebuke every empty seat this morning, Father. And we pray that you will fill it with men and women and children and young people and elderly who will be able to say, I have been saved by Jesus Christ. And so we declare harvest and many coming. And by this word that has been preached, Father, I declare an anointing on your people, anointing for salvation anointing for evangelism, grace and favor and opportunities, Lord, to share the gospel with many. And we will delight in giving you exclusively the honor and the glory. Do it by your mercy, Lord, and by your love. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people say, amen. amen. Let's go preach that gospel in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.